June 17, 1972. I was, worked for the Post for nine months. They had this, it looked like a local burglary at the Democratic headquarters. Police story, I covered the night police beat. It, it was a Saturday morning, I think the summer. Editors looked around and thought, who can we call in? Uh, who would be dumb enough to work on this story on a Saturday morning? And they thought of me immediately. And um, so I went to work with about seven or eight other people, including Carl. And uh, I went to the arraignment of the five burglars, and the judge wanted to know where one of them worked, and he, he was mumbling. He wouldn't say, kind of going, and the judge said, where? And he went, see. The judge said, speak up. Where do you work? Where did you work? And he went, CIA, Central Intelligence Agency. And I know my reaction was one of, oh, this is not follow up story. Uh, was based primarily on, on their arraignment uh, in court. And uh, it was based on a uh, information given our police reporter Al Lewis uh, by the cops saying, showing them a, an address book that one of the burglars had in his pocket. And in the address book was uh, the, uh, uh, and the name Hunt, H-U-N-T, and uh, the, the phone number was the White House phone number, which Al Lewis and all, every reporter worth his salt knew. And uh, when uh, the next day Woodward or you know, Sam, this is probably Sunday or maybe Monday, because the burglary was Saturday morning early, uh, called the number and asked to speak to Mr. Hunt. And the operator said, well, he's not here now. He's over at uh, such and such a place. Gave him another number. And uh, Woodward called him up. And Hunt answered the phone. And, and Woodward said, uh, we, we want to know why your name was in the address book of the of the Watergate burglars and uh, there was this long deathly hush and uh, and Hunt said oh my god and hung up so you had White House you have Hunt saying oh my god you had um, uh, at the other at, at a later arraignment you had one of the guys whispered to a judge the judge says, what do you do? And uh, Woodward overheard the words CIA. So God, I mean, if, if, you're, if your interest isn't, isn't whetted by this time. Is the CIA connected to this? Well, it turns out a lot of CIA people were, and they tried to use the CIA to cover up the FBI investigation, but they never uh, pinned it on the CIA. It was a White House operation, so you would not go from the CIA to the White House uh, instantly, but within several days through the work of, of another reporter, we learned there was this cryptic entry in the address books of two of the five burglars. It very simply said, H. Hunt dash W. House. And uh, so I called the White House and asked for Mr. Hunt. And he came on and I said, why is your name in the address books of these two burglars who were caught in the Democratic headquarters? And he screamed out, good God, and hung up the phone. And there was a sort of, as I've said, I am packing my bags quality to his voice that didn't tell you everything you needed to know, but certainly got you focused on, you know, this is interesting now. And of course, it turned out he'd worked for the CIA for years, he'd been working in the White House as a consultant to Chuck Colson, who was then we Nixon's made one candidate. mistake in a, in a story in which we said that, uh, uh, Woodward and Bernstein said that um, there was a slush fund of three hundred thousand uh, dollars set up in the committee to re-elect the president uh, and it was controlled by Haldeman and that one of the witnesses had testified to that slush fund to the grand jury investigating Watergate 
and I've forgotten which one it was. But uh, the following morning, uh, Dan Shore of CBS, like we saw on CBS Morning News, shoved a microphone in front of this guy and said, the Post says you did this, did you? And he said, no. And uh, the whole town shook as far as I'm concerned because that was the first time we had uh, been accused of getting anything wrong. What it turned out was that the question hinged on whether or not he'd told that to the grand jury. And since he hadn't, he was able to say no. He wasn't asked, was there a slash fund, of which, of course, there was. It turned out that he hadn't been asked. And that inter interested us a great deal, because if the prosecution wasn't asking him those interesting questions, that suggested that there was a reason they weren't, and the reason might be that they were trying to cover it up. Anyway, it took two days. And uh, we got uh, confirmation that there was. And in fact, there was a slush fund of $750,000. And uh, so th that, that gave hope to the Republicans. And of course, all of the Republican spokesmen uh, had a field day beating us upside the face over, uh, over that. But uh, it didn't last very long. That was the, Thank God. the key. The important discovery for Carl and myself was that Watergate wasn't isolated. There were other burglaries. There, were, there was a whole intelligence gathering apparatus. There were spies and all the Democratic candidates' campaigns that had been planted and were paid by the Nixon campaign. Uh, that they would sabotage campaigns, things that seemed to be simple and innocuous, but were quite devastating, false press releases and uh, accusing people of various activity and so forth, and a, a kind of sowing the seeds of some of the early stories. There was a, it led to the Senate Watergate Committee, led to the House Judiciary Committee and an impeachment investigation. The special prosecutor Cox and Jaworski investigated this put lots of people in jail. The Supreme Court ordered the president to turn over his tapes, which really sunk him, smoking gun tapes at the end. Uh, so I had just the sense that we had done some of the first work on this, that any suggestion that we had caused it or brought down a president was uh, a stretch to say the least, and not factual, that we had done stories and, but it is a process of the judiciary, the Congress, uh, the Supreme Court that led to Nixon's demise. But then, of course, if you think about it, Nixon is the one who did himself in. Nixon. The piston driving the Nixon administration was hate. Nixon was a full-blown hater. And if you listen to the tapes, it's chilling. To use the presidency as an instrument of personal revenge to settle scores too often. And that's not what the presidency is about. And what's sad about the Nixon presidency is not just the criminality and abuse of power, but the simple truth, to the best of my knowledge at this point, on those tapes, no one ever says what would be good, what would be right for the country, what would be best for the country, which of course is what a president is supposed to do. It was it seemed to always be about Nixon. How does this affect me, Nixon, the president? How do I pay someone back, either good or bad, for what they have done. Us that the, and this New York judge had, had uh, ruled that there was, uh, the statute says whoever has reason to believe that publication of certain information will be, uh, will threaten the national security of the United States shall be, uh, this was a civil suit, but the criminal equivalent would, uh, which they would certainly have done had they convicted us would have uh, put us to jail, put us all in jail, including Catherine Graham, or the possibility of it. And once you're convicted of a felony, you can't own television stations, so it would have cost us all the television stations. Uh, uh, 
I think there were two or three then, but it, you know, I think there's six now. But it would have, it was had been a, I mean, there was a lot of money on the table. So and she, she just decided. the night before we published, uh, uh, you know, the, came the the uh, critical moment, and uh, we were in my house in uh, the the staff, the reporters were all there, and the editors were there working on the copy, and uh, there was some guy writing for the next morning and uh, we, it became a time where we had to uh, get her okay and the lawyers started off by telling her. The lawyer was one of the greatest men even though he didn't approve of publishing it but he said the way he told her that was just so important. He said, I think on balance I'm against it. I mean, he didn't tear his hair out and say, God damn it, Catherine, you can't do this. It's risked the whole thing. And um, we, a bunch of us were on, I, I think I had four phones in my house and she was on, uh, the lawyer was on one of them and the editors were on the other. <clears throat> and we uh, told her she had to do it. It just had to, if she ever wanted to be taken seriously, you know. I mean, I, I shudder to think what, the way we put it. But uh, she finally said, well, okay, I say we'll publish it. And the three of the journalists all hung up immediately because we didn't want any, you know, we had what we came for and we didn't want to let her change her mind. And we published the next day. We missed the first edition, but we published it the second edition, which was, came out of Don't think of journalists as uh, automatically as patriots. Uh, one, you don't think of them as a real authorities in the question of what is classified and what isn't and what is a threat to the United States and what isn't. But in fact, at that time, we were. I mean, we, we were more expert than a lot of the government witnesses who testified against us, like an assistant secretary of defense uh, who had been, uh, you know, a year or two before uh, head of a big Republican contributor and the head of an automobile company and you know sold cars in Omaha or somewhere and so we, we and and you know uh, most of us had served in World War two most of us had quite fancy uh, uh, security clearances in that capacity so we did and there was no threat to the national security and information truth is not a threat to security I didn't like the Navy I didn't like Vietnam and uh, didn't like the war, and I was disappointed in myself that I didn't figure out how to adjust to being a part of this that I didn't like, and so I didn't quite have the guts to run away or stand on principle. It was a difficult time uh, to be associated with something you pretty sure is not right. You can't prove it's not right, but you think it's not right. And my last year I served in the Navy uh, here in Washington and uh, lived over on P Street and decided I would get a subscription to a paper called the Washington Post that had a young, very feisty editor named Ben Bradley and started reading the Post and during that, that year, 1969, 1970, you could just feel the energy in the newspaper. You could feel that they took not an adversarial position toward government, but a position of skepticism, uh, uh, a position of w there is accountability reporting. Why did this happen? How did it happen? What's secret? What's not known? What does it mean? And I was, in a sense, there were the two worlds of the Navy where all the opposite principles seemed to prevail. Uh, and then there was the Washington Post there at my doorstep every morning, kind of saying, you know, wait a minute, uh, what 
what's the government up to? What, what is this uh, secret to go to law school after five years in the Navy? So I was age 27 and I got a job at a weekly paper in Montgomery County, Maryland and for $110 a week. And I called my father, who was a judge at that point, or about to become a judge, and said, I'm not going to law school, but have this job in a newspaper he'd never heard of. And my father, a man of uh, great restraint, non-judgmental, in fact, uh, said probably the severest thing he's ever said to me. He said, you're crazy. And at the same time, it was my decision. So it was, he didn't think it was a good idea. He, he always uh, saw me as a lawyer. To a certain extent, I always saw myself as a lawyer. And I was going on a, an unknown path, and that concerned him. But when I got into it and uh, then went to work for the Post, Somebody he came was quite from sorry. Mars to America and went around for months or years. And then you ask them who has the best jobs, they'd say the journalists, because the journalists get to make momentary entries into people's lives when they're interesting and get out when they cease to be interesting. And most jobs, if you're a lawyer or a doctor, you have to deal with clients, patients who have boring problems or diseases or are, that are routine, and of course the definition of news is non-routine. What's, what's going on in uh, the town and culture and the nation and the world is news, and you get to work hospital in Geneva, Illinois, but lived in Wheaton, which is the home of Billy Graham, the evangelist, so it was very fundamentalist Christian. There were no bars in town. People who went to Wheaton College had to sign a pledge. No drinking, smoking, dancing, movies, playing of cards. And so it was a, the classic kind of Winesburg, Ohio, small town. Uh, my father was a lawyer there, and I worked as a janitor in his law office when I was in high school and started reading the files and discovered that the projection that people in the town made about their own lives was in fact not who they were, that lots of them had secrets and many of them were in my father's law. Office. Distinct memories I have of books are from college. William Faulkner's books, uh, Certainly, probably one of my favorites, favorite books is uh, All the King's Men, Robert Penn Warren's book about political corruption in Louisiana and about a reporter who watches this and gets to participate and see but doesn't have all of the full consequences of the action. Journalism is a practice, that you, like law, that you uh, keep learning. Uh, you are trying to get it right, and you never do. And that there must be a sense, whenever you get to something and then realize two weeks earlier, or two days, or two minutes earlier, you didn't know that, and it's critical. Uh, that no matter what you do, you're never going to have the full story. And that so you're dealing a glancing blow to what's out there. You want to deal a careful glancing blow. You want to spend time on it. You want to make sense out of it. You want it to be fair. But in the end, well, it's only a glancing in my business, I found is that we basically do have a free press that we can operate independently. But the real input comes from people who believe in a free press, believe in the First Amendment, believe in open discourse as much as possible, 
hate secrets, hate secret government, hate secret concentrations of power. And so in an odd way, those uh, in my business have a million allies out there, people who are basically truth tellers, want to help somebody, know that the truth is cleansing, that the truth is a, is a, is a good thing, that the society needs to function on that, and that in a little way and often in a significant way that's realized that we do uh, explain enough about what's going on that we that I think in the atmosphere we're in now uh, somebody who would get up and propose some of the things that were done in Vietnam like conducting the war when you didn't believe in it or burglarizing or wiretapping or doing the abusive things of Watergate. I think it, it, it's so ingrained that there are enough people who would stand up and say, we can't do that. We shouldn't do that. Uh, that doesn't mean there won't be more scandals and maybe, maybe even larger scandals, but in a sense the vision or the dream of the people who wrote the Constitution has, uh, at least in part, been real.